I have a fun question for you all. Who here, uh, raise your hand if you're from Germany. Who is from Germany? All right, cool to know. Who is from Holland? All right, also a lot of people. Who is from the French-speaking part of Belgium? All right. Who is from Flanders? All right. Great. Great to see. Uh, so let's have some fun. Let's go. Uh, let's do a recap because it's a, the true story is that in 2011, I wrote in the feedback form of Brucon 2011 that I would be really interested in a recap of the major thing that happened, happened in the past year. Because with so much things happening day after day, it's hard to keep up, right? Nobody has time to always stay on top of things. We do pretend to stay on top of things, certainly to our boss. But in reality, uh, nobody has a time to stay on top of everything. So let's take a nostalgic trip down memory lane down the past year to see the most important things that happened the past year and the biggest dramas. Who am I? Well, I'm Dieter van den Bos. Uh, I'm addicted to learning geeky stuff like many of you. In my case, it's all things technical, uh, science, astronomy, birds, insects. And yes, birds, bird geeks are real geeks as well. We count as well, because when we talk, uh, actually, yeah, the feathers are only covered, cover 50% of the beak, so it's not a raven, uh, then it's a crow. We are, uh, we count too. And I'm in since, since 2009 in security. Um, I've been working since then for KBC, KBC Bank. I was a threat intelligence analyst, a technical one, technical threat intelligence analyst for the uh, group CERT, for the entire group. And uh, I combined that in my le last years with uh, being the lead for the attack service management program for the entire group. So attack service management, what is that? That's uh, keeping an eye of external attack service management, keeping an eye on the, the vulnerabilities uh, that are exposed to the internet of companies. And that's what I now combine. So I left KBC and I, I combine threat intelligence now with external attack service management. So that's what I do. I started <coughs> threat exposure. Threat exposure is an attack service management company. And so we check every day what hackers are doing, and then we check our customers if they have that new uh, emerging vulnerability or not. And we, of course, also check the other vulnerabilities that normal attack service management companies check as well. So let's, let's start, let's jump in. Let's go exactly one year ago um, to September last year. The first thing that happened, the first major thing that happened after uh, Brucon was the MGM ransomware attack. It crippled the entire MGM casino. Even the key cards for the rooms were not working anymore. And by uh, October 11th, we learned how it worked. Well, the scattered spider, uh, that threat actor, scattered because yeah, they, they come from all over the place, a loose group of uh, mostly young adults. They get in by calling MGM's help desk and pretending to be an employee. And from January to June, we indeed saw three young adults being arrested from the UK and the US. MGM doesn't pay any ransom back then, and they're really proud of it, and for good reason, because they don't want to sponsor cybercrime groups. So really good. The cyber attack costed them $100 million, so they took a big hit. Now, what is most ironic, you guys know, what is most ironic there is that a few days before that threat actor attacked MGM, they attacked Caesars. And Caesars just paid 15 million to stop it. Here's 15 million. Uh, please, scattered spider, scattered spider, stop attack. And uh, I guess they kind of motivated scattered spider to do it again. Uh, yeah, for good reason. Or I understand why. Then we have Citrix Bleed. On 10th of October, we learned about Citrix Bleed the, with that vulnerability in Citrix devices, Citrix ADC and gateway appliances. You can steal the authentication cookie and log in to Citrix devices. Mandiant revealed that the flaw was abused for months before the patch came out. So we can imagine it's many, uh, 
many big companies have Citrix, so it was a massacre, but most stayed under the radar. The only uh, the, the big ones we know victims are Boeing, Allen uh, and Overread, one of the biggest law firms in the world, DP World, one of the biggest uh, sea transportation companies in the world, and Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, the biggest bank of the world. They all got hit, even with their big budget, still uh, it was in inevitable. Then around that time also we got a lot of panic for the HTTP2 rapid reset attack. You guys remember it, the panic was real. Eh? We had to update all devices that supported HTTP2. Uh, so all web servers that supported it, and it's quite common to support it because it's been around for quite some time. And it was a, there was a new DDoS record, everybody panicked, update, update. And in the end, I don't know if you guys heard about it anymore, I didn't. So I searched what was the real world, in, world impact and nothing is published about it. So uh, talk to me if you know, I'm very interested because I haven't seen any published uh, real world impact, although, Mandiant, uh, although Cloudflare and Google says there was. Then, 23 and me, the heck, for months, the, uh, there, come, there was uh, some details coming out, and 23 and me says, no, uh, it's nothing, it's only a small, small hack. They downplayed it for months, and they, they blame it on the customers. For those who don't know 23 and me, they analyze your DNA. They send you uh, a tube to spit in, and then you have to hock to and spit in that thing. <laughs> and that's how it works, then they analyze your DNA, uh, and that DNA they analyzed and it got stolen. So if you did it, if you did HOC2 in the past, uh, then maybe your, your uh, DNA information is stolen. Um, the names and addresses, just an example, names and addresses belonging to 1 million 23andMe customers with Jewish heritage were on breach forums. So that's just one example, there's way more that uh, was for sale but that's just one example, so you can imagine the impact of that hack. And uh, important there, the reason why they got in is just that customers didn't use any uh, MFA. So uh, with credential stuffing, they got in. And a question last year, because I, I gave the same talk last year, last year I asked how many times I said uh, Chinese APT, that Chinese APT was caused a hack and I asked to count it. This year, I need someone to ask, uh, to count, or actually everybody can count how many times I will say lagging MFA this year. And the first one to say it at the end, I will buy you a beer, because that's what BrewCon is all about. So uh, how many times I will say M lagging MFA? It's not much, but it is significant. It is interesting. Then the people in Flanders um, really know about this case, the attack on Limburg.net, really, really known one. They say it's the biggest hack ever in Belgium. Like, I don't agree at all, but that's how the media goes with it, of course. And um, what many don't know is actually how they got in, and how they got in was via RDP. So RDP, the number one way, uh, Palo Alto says it, the number one way for ransomware to get in, well, in the case of Limburg.net, it was uh, just that, RDP uh, server lagging MFA. A question for you all. Who can fill in the gap? Ransom payments to ransomware gangs are, it's a quote of the Minister of Finances, Vincent van Petegem. Who can answer it? You guys know it, I'm sure. Come on, come on, come on, who knows it? Tax deductible, they're tax deductible as business expenses. <laughs> How crazy is that? That's Belgium for you. So, uh, a good friend of mine, Simon van der Perre, from cyber, uh, Orange Cyber Defense, he says, by paying ransomware, you're financing cybercrime and cybercriminals use their profit from ransomware attacks to launch new attacks on other companies. 
I agree. I totally agree with it. I looked it up, and uh, fines are not tax deductible. Uh, yeah, G gambling money also not tax deductible. Um, giving money to politicians not tax deductible. It's even illegal to do, um, which I understand, <laughs> by the way. But um, then you wonder: so, giving money to politicians is not okay. Giving money to Russian cybercrime gangs, millions of cybercrime gangs, we support it by making it tax deductible. That's strange, right? Um, so, a question for you, you guys. Who thinks, raise your hands if you think it's a good idea that they are tax deductible. Which I would understand from a business perspective, there are some good arguments to make. Okay, then question, who thinks it's a bad idea that it's tax deductible? Come on, eh? let's see. Let's hope some politicians see it because uh, the majority here raised their hand. So that's crazy. Uh, anyway, let's move on. Three million smart toothbrushes were just used in a DDoS attack. <laughs> really? And you already know where this is going. The really part is the most ironic part uh, because it was reported by, reported by a Swiss newspaper after an interview with Fortinet. And Fortinet explained the situation that the DDoS knocked out a Swiss company for several hours, costing millions of euros. It went viral all over the world very quickly. And uh, except it wasn't true. It wasn't true at all. Everybody took it over. It wasn't true. Fortinet said, actually, it, it was just a hypothetical story that they told to the, new, uh, to the journalist. And if you ask me, I think it went viral because we all thought it was plausible, because we maybe a bit of visual thinking, even. Because toothbrushes nowadays, they even uh, use AI. <laughs> so this time it wasn't true, but next time uh, it's definitely plausible. The iSoon leak. iSoon is a Chinese company, a hack for hire, APT for hire, actually, for multiple Chinese authorities. A lot of data was leaked from them. Uh, on GitHub, it was quickly deleted, although it had 1,800 forks. So it has been copied all over the world. Uh, so people could see um, around 80 targets. Uh, for example, government of India, Thailand, Vietnam, South Korea, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and so on. So they went the last years on a real hacking spree. Now, what is the most funny about this is, uh, the most funny detail is that they had information about the chairman of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, and nobody wanted it. So they hacked it in some way. So he said, the chat logs reveal, hey, we got stuff from the chairman, Jens Stoltenberg. Uh, but sorry, they're not interested. The clients are not interested. Yeah, but what, what about making it cheaper? I'm really learning, running low on money. And still, they weren't interested. Yeah, and you can see the proof. Huh? You can see the proof clearly, Jens Stoltenberg. All, <laughs> all the rest is total Chinese for me. Then. Logbit, uh, the, big, the big hackers got hacked. The Logbit, uh, the big thing that happened the past year. Logbit is the biggest ransomware group ever. I'll explain it in a minute. The disruption attack, um, the disruption campaign was led by the British National Crime Agency. Logbit is famous for, of infamous, for example, for uh, hacking Accenture, British Royal Mail, uh, the city of Kerensberg, Maldegem, province of Namur, French Ministry of Justice, Canada's largest periodic hospital, and so on. In total, um, 2,500 victims, says the Department of Justice in the US, more than 500 million in ransomware was paid to them. At the height, at the maximum, they had 194 affiliates. And affiliates, as you know, those are the ones that do the real hacking. Uh, Logbit Sub, in this case, is really good in communication. That's what he does. And uh, he hires uh, 
um, uh, programmer to make malware. So the ransomware gangs, they just make the malware, do the communication, the affiliates do all the rest, do the real hacking. Nine, 194 people worked for, for LogBitSub. That's crazy. It's, it's also way more, way more than any other ransomware gang. Um, and I think the reason, one of the reasons, one of the reasons is uh, that 80% of the ransom went to the affiliate. For example, our evil, their um, uh, 30 to 40 percent went to the affiliate. So that was a real revolution, and uh, they earned a lot of money with it, unfortunately. And as you, you will see in the next graph, why it, uh, why it is the biggest ransomware group ever, this is Logbit, the amount of victims ever. That's crazy, yeah? the number one place by far. And actually, um, the Orange Cyber Defense, they say that the number of victims is actually 50 to 60% higher. And there, because not all victims reach the leak site. So this, this, is, this is the graph of the post, victims posted on the extortion site to this date, eh, ever. Um, but not all victims reach it to the extortion to the leak site. And you can, you can guess the reason why that is because they contact the threat actor and say, we will pay, we will pay. Don't put us on the side. Unfortunately, that's how it goes. A lot of those things stay under the radar. In 2021, Logbit, Logbit Sub, the leader, he said jokingly that they would give money to anyone who would get a tattoo of the logo of Logbit Sub. Yeah. Of course, nobody did it. Eh? Who's crazy enough to, to put a, uh, the logo, uh, to tattoo it on your body? Nobody's crazy enough, right? Right? Probably somebody is. Probably somebody is, and somebody was indeed. These guys, they put a tattoo on their body. Uh, Logbits up, promised them 1,000 euros. It's not clear how much they got. It's been reported uh, by internal sources that they did pay but not how much. And um, I did some digging. I did some digging on the internet, and not just these three people did it. But I count, around 14 people did it. How crazy is this? They all tattooed the logo, Logbit logo on their body. March 6th, also in Flanders, in Belgium, really known, because Duvel Mortgat is really known all over the world. We're very proud of it. Uh, they got hit with ransomware attack. All over the news, it was Stormus. They said, ah, Stormus is the ransomware gang that hacked uh, Duvel. But actually, Stormus, we knew that they are fakers. They uh, pretend to do ransomware. So, uh, Duel was in the news, and then I say, ah, yeah, we did it, pay us. But actually, it's Black Basta. Black Basta was the real ones uh, that that did it. So there were all the news outlets just copy each other, but uh, it all, that just like the toothbrushes, it wasn't real. So Black Basta was it. Black Basta, by the way, has a lot of links with Conti. I never have, see, uh, have seen um, real evidence they are the same group. If you guys have any proof, let me know, but I have never seen any proof that can really say, okay, they are the same group, uh, but they have a lot of links. Uh, thanks, Evan, really good beer, my favorite beer, uh, by the American Boulevard, the American part of the Moortgat. So what happened, indeed, Boulevard actually was targeted, so Boulevard um, yeah, was infiltrated, was, was, was hacked, two file servers, were breached by that American daughter. Uh, so that's, the focus was on America, but also access, they had also access to the Belgian the domain controller. Uh, for example, the domain admin uh, passwords were just leaked on the internet, the hackers had that. Uh, and as we know, one day later, the main brewery of Duval was back in action. Let's hope they uh, just uh, separate the industrial and the, the normal network really well because that was uh, really interesting to see the, how fast they recovered. Very highly mediatized, so 
Uh, I'm sure you all guys know it, XC Utils Backdoor, uh, very famous one. XC is a compression tool, and it's used, for example, in SSH daemon. Uh, that's how it got in SSH daemon. There it was uh, discovered. It was three years in the making, and on the left you can see an example of uh, Jigar Kumar, a user, saying, ah, but the maintainer is not good, you have to change the maintainer. Uh, in the end, they changed the maintainer uh, to the new maintainer, but that new guy, or he helped at least, that new guy uh, was malicious, it was we don't know which threat actor it was, but we do know he was persistent because he they took so long uh, to get in. And by the way, that Chigar Kumar guy that wrote that uh, message, we never heard of him again. So clearly a fake persona. It was found by Andres Freund from Germany, uh, which was a Postgres developer working at Microsoft who thought his CPU levels were suspicious. That's massive respect for him, the whole uh, InfoSec community, uh, of course, has big respect for him. On March the 20th, Microsoft was hacked. Again, actually, we found out how Microsoft was hacked, because what actually happened, that was that actually in May and June already last year, a Chinese cyber espionage group, Storm 0558, uh, compromised Microsoft Exchange Online mailboxes of 22 organizations, or organizations around the world. And State Department of the US was one example, and from them alone they stole 60,000 emails. And US officials looked at it, and their conclusion was, it's all, it's Microsoft's their own fault. A cascade of security failures at Microsoft caused this hack, we learned. And a cascade of security failures, I think that's the government way of saying Microsoft did a real big cluster fuck up. True, right? Cascade of security failures. I'm sure they were talking uh, internally that it was a cluster fuck up. So, for example, two examples, they found, the hackers found a key from 2016, and the key was still valid after seven years, a really important key. And then in September, the hackers, uh, Microsoft said, September 2023, they said, the hackers found the key in a crash dump. Again, it went all over the world, every news outlet said it, everybody accepted it, Microsoft says, the hackers find, found the key in a crash dump. In March, they said, we have not found a crash dump containing the impacted key. It was just a theory. And so what happened? The state officials said to Microsoft, OK, so you said in September that it was uh, caused by, uh, that the key was in a crash dump. Show us the proof. And then Microsoft said, uh, yeah, actually, we don't have the proof. OK, but you said it, uh, the July, yeah, actually. Okay, then you have to publish it that it wasn't true, that you, uh, that you lied. And then they had to pressure them, Microsoft, over and over again uh, until they said, actually, it wasn't true. So that's just crazy. Um, maybe something, uh, uh, something interesting, Storm 0558, just if you want to know who they are, well, actually, we don't know. At least the public, in the public, we don't know. Storm, that's just a number. It's like Mandiant also uses UNC a lot, uncategorized for, for Chinese state-sponsored, for Chinese uh, APTs. And the reason is, is because China is so uh, decentralized. Like Isoon, for example, is a company that, that, with that leak we learned that that company works for many local authorities. For every pro so APT1, that's the People Liberation Army. Then it was simple. APT1, like, I don't know, 12 years ago or something, or 14 years ago. Then it was simple. Um, then we learned that uh, the Ministry of State uh, Security was the number one intelligence, uh, the, the more, number one hacking group in China, the official one. Okay, then it was, then it was simple. But last year's, we saw many APTs, right, from China 
the, the one APT uh, so much, APT this, APT that, and that's because it's just really hard to attribute it. If you don't know ISOON yet, you don't know which group is this, uh, it's not really uh, nice aligned. That's why it's really hard to do attribution in China. That's why we actually don't know who this Storm 558 group is. Then, so this was not the only one, the only time that Microsoft got hacked recently, right? You guys, maybe it's one big blur for you guys, for me as well, uh, because they were hacked so many times, but let me clear the diet for you guys, because, wait, there is more. Before I jump into what happened, you need to know who, solar, uh, who Midnight Blizzard is. Midnight Blizzard is really known uh, for the, the hack at SolarWinds 2020, the biggest and boldest supply chain attack ever. They hacked thousands of companies, or they, at least they had malware in thousands of companies. And then uh, the Russians said, hmm, but actually we don't only need a few of them, actually we, we only want to target a couple of them. And a couple of them, that is uh, Microsoft. Microsoft's one of the targets uh, of, of Midnight Blizzard at that point. So Midnight Blizzard, uh, the SVR, or uh, Cozy Bear, or APT29, depending on, uh, they all overlap, um, depending on how to, but, uh, which company says it, or which company is tracking them. Then, so SolarWinds, now we know SolarWinds, then they did a, the hack number two in July, July 25th, 25th in 2021. They hacked them again, uh, Midnight Blizzard hacked Microsoft again. And then this year, January 19th, they hacked them again for the third time, and in March 24th, uh, March 8th, they hacked them for the fourth time. Then you know it will not be the last time, right? They are targeting, targeting them uh, really a lot, so it will not be the last time that they get in at Microsoft. Um, something interesting about the hack in January, well, they got in via legacy test account on Azure by simply guessing passwords. And you guessed right because they didn't have MFA. Voila. Um, so they're really targeted and now Microsoft, of course, they say, okay, now security is a priority. It's over, security is a priority. Um, we are making security our top priority, says the ex executive vice president of Microsoft Security, and we prioritize it above all else, above all features. That's quite bold thing to say, eh? So, um, yeah, whatever. Anyway, next topic. Next topic. Microsoft announces recall. <laughs> It was really fun uh, to see the cyber shoot community fighting uh, Microsoft. It was one big fight. And Microsoft said, for example, it was photographic memory of your PC life. And they said that, and, and it's true, that um, every few seconds there's a screenshot from your screen, uh, as you know, a screenshot from your screen, and then it's put via AI in a searchable database to see everything you ever did everything you ever typed. So photographic memory of your PC life actually is more a built-in information stealer slash password grabber. But then Microsoft said, yeah, but only admins can read the database. Only admins can read the database. Not, not true. Yeah, but users on the same device cannot access each other's database. You just can access your own database. Not, <laughs> not true. And then, but okay, we all know how it ended. On June 14th, recall got recalled. We are all hoping for that. And uh, yeah, that's, that's how everybody communicated it. Not, it just got delayed till October, till October because that's when Windows Insiders can use it with uh, Copilot Co Plus PCs, and who knows what Microsoft will do with it afterwards. So, uh, uh, yeah, it was a, a f it was a fun ride, and in a way, the security community won, won I think. Then one of the biggest, 
the biggest hacks ever, the biggest leaks, I'll explain, is Snowflake. Snowflake, because in between, uh, in May actually, we learned about some hacks, and some big hacks, and there wasn't much details, but in the end we learned that AT&T uh, in April um, was hacked and the data got stolen of 109 million customers, almost all mobile customers. Months worth of calls and text records uh, were for sale. And uh, so the text records are not the real SMSs, but the metadata. The threat actor, oh no, actually they pay the threat actor uh, $37,000 to delete the data. And they, they paid it to Shiny Hunter, Shiny Hunters on breach, uh, on breach forums, it was again um, uh, sold. And quite ironic because they hacked them in 2011 as well, or they sold data of AT&T in 2011 as well, I found. So way to go to sponsor your, uh, your own hackers. May 14th, data stolen um, for 30 million customers and employees of Santander. The biggest bank, no, one of the biggest, uh, certainly the biggest in Europe, or one of the biggest, one of the biggest in the world as well. Shiny Hunters claims it again, it, it contains 28 million credit card numbers. 28 million, that's just crazy. And then May 20th, Shiny Hunters uh, claims data from 560 million customers from Ticketmaster. And that's one of the largest data breaches ever, as you can imagine. So we, yeah, we didn't learn much, um, but we heard of the, the name Snowflake, but Snowflake said, ah, they also were downplaying it, so it wasn't clear, but actually, uh, after some time, it actually was clear that the hack happened, or the, the leak happened at the SaaS application of Snowflake. Snowflake is a leading cloud-based data storage and analytics provider, and uh, they say it's just the customer uh, credentials uh, were used because, and they were, yeah, they were, were used to get in leaked credentials because they lacked MFA. So, um, on June 10th, Mandiant, uh, without an anal analysis, published an analysis, they said UNC 5537 is behind it. Uh, uh, it yeah, it's just a number, it doesn't mean that much UNC, UNC uncategorized. And that's because it's also like Scattered Spider, it's a group of teenagers or young adults um, that, uh, yeah, a loose group that, that not always the same people do it. And Kevin Bowman says they are a teen, teen crimeware group and they often communicate via breach forums, a uh, really famous uh, for community for hackers in the US and North America and around the world. So there was a big community of those young adults uh, trying to earn some money. Um, they, Median says 165 potentially impacted uh, organizations they found and they contacted them all to, to warn them um, that, that, uh, yeah, that they were maybe, that, that the data was leaked from them. Threat actors claim, for example, Anhauser Anha Bush, the American part of AB InBev, Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi, and so on. A prediction, a future prediction, this kind of attack will continue as long as there are sites relying on passwords only. So in 2050, we will probably still have this, these kind of hacks. Because the only thing that the hackers need to do, and that's what happened in this case, they just check the databases online of InfoStealer malware. We know InfoStealer malware for, for at least a decade. They're just uh, malware that one employee of your company needs to have it, the malware, and, uh, they, and, if the, and then his credentials are leaked, the passwords are grabbed, put in a database, sold online, uh, and it's becoming more and more ma mainstream nowadays uh, to get the credentials from there and use it for SaaS applications and so on. So something really, it will, uh, it will uh, future prediction, it will not stop. Voila. So, that's uh, the whole snowflake incident. 
we wrap up that snowflake incident. Now the next one. Giggles in the room because we all know uh, the drama that happened. Maybe who, who had to work in the weekend or on Friday uh, to, to analyze it, solve it? Oh, not so much. Okay, we are, so uh, that's good. I, I can laugh at the people that uh, had a weekend full of work. And, uh, and uh, you, will not, you will not feel uh, that I'm personally talking to you. So Clown Strike. The, the, a funny name for what happened. The cloud, uh, crowd strike cost the exact same thing that companies pay them to protect them for. 8.5 million systems impacted with this crowd strike flu. Every single Windows machine that got the update got a blue screen of that. So that means that they didn't test it on one single Windows machine. And by the way, the screenshot, it also went around the world uh, virally. It isn't true. It isn't, uh, it is fake. It's funny anyway. So what the, does that mean? So only one, they had to only test it on one single Windows machine. What does that mean? Does it mean that it's just one lazy bastard that wrote the update? It's Friday. Enter, I'm going home. No, that's not what happened, because they have a lot of validation systems, a lot of validation testing they do, automate, automated testing that they did. The system uh, where the bug was in also was, qu uh, was uh, quite some months old, so they relied on it, they thought it was uh, okay. So it's not just one lazy bastard we can blame. Um, they did test it on their own systems. That's what you should do, right? But they only had, they, uh, the whole company had Macs. They didn't have uh, Windows. <laughs> That's what happens, that was happens. Of course, now they do it, now they learn from it. Uh, if you, uh, so, now you can, now, you, now they are the most, that I, I guess, now you can trust CrowdStrike, I don't know if it's true, but I guess you can trust, trust CrowdStrike to never have that happen again, but we'll see how it goes. To express their gratitude, CrowdStrike free gave a free coffee indeed. <laughs> and you also know what happened with that free coffee? Do you know? Exactly it didn't work. Exactly. Uber thought that's not, that's not normal that so many times the same uh, code was used and they blocked it. And also so, uh, something funny, McAfee also pulled the, uh, pulled the Christ tag in 2010 with SVC host, really important process in Windows, and they said it was malicious. Uh, some of you maybe remember it. Uh, I, I certainly do. Uh, it has a lot of, has made a lot of damage. And guess who was the CTO? The same from George Kurtz, the CEO uh, from CrowdStrike, indeed. The CTO back then was the CEO of CrowdStrike. Uh. All right. So those were the most important things that happened. The times. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, that's clear. That's clear. <laughs> I owe you a beer. Great. Four times. Yeah. Lack of MFA. I said it four times indeed. And let me reiterate that in the conclusion. I only stated the facts. So you can make your own conclusion um, out of all the facts. Come to me later to say what your conclusion is of this all. It would be really interesting uh, to discuss it with you. Um, my conclusions are, for example, teenage hackers with new skills will keep popping up. Well, for example, uh, lapses. They will keep the lapses is a really big, uh, good example. They are really good. At, or work really good or are really good. In cloud hacking, for example, the new stuff, the new skills, social engineering, MFA fatigue, um, the new things, teenage hackers will keep doing that in the future. The, the community is there, so why not? And the days are over to rely on passwords uh, without MFA. That's quite clear, I guess. So in your company, 
if you had a hard time to say, okay, don't use always MFA or go passwordless, if you had a hard time, just uh, use this presentation to sell it, uh, it will work out. And the last conclusion, um, just one slide uh, still, the last conclusion is this will not stop, next year will not be boring. That's for sure. All right, so the presentation of the day you can find here. Uh, yeah, and I will here, be here the next two days. I will be on the party uh, this afternoon or this, this night. Uh, so hopefully you find it interesting. Um, I had fun uh, researching everything. Thank you. So when, any questions? We have one day. You mentioned a lot about uh, multi-factor authentication. Uh, what is your opinion on pass keys? I think it's the future. I haven't heard that many arguments saying yeah, that um, it's not good. So even if you are if you if you have arguments uh, against it. It's still way better than passwords. It's a hundred times better than passwords. So I would definitely, uh, for me, it's the future. Yeah. I don't know if, if you have a, another opinion or something, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so MFA indeed, what he said is uh, MFA. You can fish as well. Uh, if you're fast enough, uh, you can fish it as well. Or you can disable it. Uh, many things you can do it, but passwordless uh, is better than than MFA even. At least that's my opinion, of course, and my only my humble opinion. Other questions? I think this is it. Thank you. Thank you.